hide us and say, and you confirm this often. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strives about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Very simple, isn't it? If somebody don't want to listen, bye. There's nothing more I can do. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for your promises. I pray for your word that it would find a lodging place in the hearts and minds of all of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Years ago, I would say about 50 years ago, probably more, 55, maybe 60 years ago, I remember my grandfather, they, he loved puzzles. He loved putting puzzles together. And he put this puzzle together that had a bunch of pieces to it. I mean, it just uh, a huge puzzle. And when he got done, it was a picture of somewhere in Egypt with the uh, old Egyptian uh, buildings and a couple of lions that were standing, sitting around these columns and stuff that you see in all Egyptian uh, pictures of, of old Egypt. And it's two beautiful, a male and a female lion and a lamb or something standing nearby. It was a, it's a very beautiful picture. And he took that puzzle and he put it on a table and he began on the wall of the house that he lived in. I, I think he thought, well, this is a good easel right here. And he begins to draw this picture right off of the cover of this uh, puzzle of the box and this puzzle that he had put together. And many years that puzzle was right there. It was painted on top of the wallpaper. And when my my grandfather died. One of the boys, he had five boys and two girls. One of the kids took and carefully began to cut out the wallpaper with this picture. And somewhere in the family, there is this picture that is all rolled up that comes from a puzzle that our grandfather put together, not only put it together on a table, but also painted it on the wall. But all of us have done puzzles. And the saddest thing when you're building a puzzle that that would be that there would be a piece that is missing or two pieces. And you look under everything. You look under the table. You look under the bed. You look under everything. Where is I, It's not complete until I find that other piece. And sometimes we cannot find the other piece. And we wad it all up and throw it in the trash because a puzzle that is not complete is not any picture at all. Really, it's not worth anything but praise the Lord when you find all the pieces life is like that life is like this puzzle that we're putting together none of us none of us has got the whole thing put together yet none of us knows exactly what the end of our lives is going to be it is a mystery but praise the Lord the Bible says that he had a plan for you and for me before we were even formed he says before I formed you in the womb I already had plans for you. I already knew your name. And I began to listen to a pastor this morning as he was talking about the plan that God has got it all rolled out. He's got it all painted on, on something, your life. And in and, and the, and the plan of God, your life is beautiful. Your life is prosperous. Your life is full of, uh, of envy, so to speak, because what God puts together, I'm telling you what, is just nothing like it. And our lives are like that. And somebody thought to themselves, you might think to yourself, well, if my life has already been painted by God, why is my life so ugly? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much strife and sickness? Well, you know what? It's because God has got a plan for you, but a lot of people refuse to live out the plan of God. Well, what is the plan for my life, Pastor? Is right here. It's not a mystery. Our lives might be a mystery to us, but they're not a mystery to God. God is putting lives together. God is making things for all of us every day. And I pray that when we leave here today, we can find out something that is profound, 
something that is going to help us for tomorrow. If you've been repented of your sins, if you have been baptized in Jesus' name, if you've been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and if you're fighting the fight, not if you quit, not if you quit, but if you're fighting, Paul said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, henceforth is laid up for me a crown. Did Paul say, I'm perfect? No. Did Paul say, I have no sin? No, Paul was the first one that I admitted. He said, I, of sinners, I am the chiefest. He was admitting, I got problems. He said, Paul said, and he wrote most of the New Testament. Paul was saying, I have learned one thing, that when I would do good, evil is present. So he said, with my soul, I worship God. But with my flesh, I fall short because the flesh can never be saved. You're never going to get to the place where you don't want to sin, where you don't want to have temptation, where you don't want to do the things of the world. But here is salvation, saints of God, when we keep fighting, when we take one day at a time. Paul said, I'm not turning back. I'm not going to quit. He was incarcerated. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was punch in the face but he kept on fighting he says since I have fought and since I finished the course henceforth this laid for me a crown of righteousness and he invites us all he says not only to me but to everyone that loves his appearing so this is not a thing just for the apostolics not just for the United Pentecostal Church God is saying come unto me come I will give you rest there is a, 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 a group of people, and we were visited by one of these people the other day. And I want to clarify something here today in our, in our message because I'm the pastor. And it's my job, like a shepherd that is guarding the sheep, that if something doesn't look right, we, we, we got to make the sheep aware. There, there, there's a, a man that some of you might remember him. I'm not saying he's an evil man. I'm not saying he's not a man of God. But there is a, a group of people that have latched on to things in the Bible that are biblical. There are truths. But we are not to place our foundation on these things. We need to put our foundation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, there is a group of people that have placed all their marbles, so to speak, Everything that they talk about, everything that they do is about the Sabbath. They're called Seventh-day Adventists. And what they're trying to prove to the rest of the world, that all of us are worshiping on Sunday. And Sunday is not the Sabbath. That Saturday is the Sabbath. And you know what? It's the truth. Saturday is the Sabbath. But the Bible has left us with enough information that we do not put one day above another. That we are not called to the law. The Sabbath was given to the Jewish people to keep that day holy. But you know what? We are above that kind of a call. When God called you into this call, he said, this is the rest upon which I will cause the weary to rest. This is the rest. This is the real rest. The Jewish people find Saturday as their day of rest. And they are told, keep that day holy. But I'm here to tell you that if you are baptized in Jesus' name, you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, you have entered into a rest, whereas every day, every morning, every night, when I wake up in the morning, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. My Sabbath started when I was about six years old when I got the Holy Ghost in Kingsville, Texas. I began to rest. When you are rested in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no longer a longing for something else. I've never longed for marijuana. I've never craved a bottle of beer. I've never craved for a needle to go into my arm. I'm not condemning people that have done that. I'm just saying that if, if that has gotten a hold of you, those of you that are listening maybe online, I'm telling you, when you find Jesus, you'll find yourself to be complete. And there will be no longing. I, I, I remember a saint 
in uh, Wabash, Indiana, when we first got baptized in Jesus' name, when we first found out that we could be baptized, there was a lady there by the name of Barb Wagner. She was a widow. She'd been married, I believe, two, maybe three times. I'm not sure. Um, and all her husbands had died. And so I think she got the hint. And she didn't remarry, so she stayed a widow, and she raised three boys, fine boys, Rick, Steve, and Bill. Bill's my brother-in-law, and uh, they had a daughter named Nancy, was the oldest. And all of them played instruments. They played, Steve played the saxophone, Bill played the organ, Nancy played the accordion, uh, and Sister Widener played the piano, Rick played the bass, and they all would get up. When we first got to that little church, for me to hear them sing, it just filled my heart. And they used to sing a song. I searched for him, and I knew not what I searched for. I longed for him, but I knew not what I longed for. But then I found Jesus and knew that I would search no more. For he filled that longing down in my soul. And I, I can sing that song today, that I'm not looking for another wife. I'm not looking for a love affair somewhere. I'm not looking for to get drunk. Why? Because I've got Jesus and I am complete. I am full. So pastor, are you saying you're perfect? No, far from it. But I got he, which is perfect, living inside of me. And I, I've got scripture for that in just a minute. But there are a, another group of people that are going around saying that Jesus is not the name that Yahshua or Yashu or something else that is Hebrew, that that is the name, that we need to forget about Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that if they think that God doesn't understand the name Jesus, they are absolutely wrong. The English name of Jesus is not recognized in heaven. Are you kidding me? It is recognized in hell. I've seen that in the name of Jesus, demons have obeyed. I've seen people pay, pray for a, uh, my wife and I. When we first came here, we, we were sound asleep and they come and they knocked at our door and says, would you please come? Our mother, it, 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 something is wrong with her. And, and so we didn't know what to expect. We were kind of new in Immokalee. We didn't know anybody. We got our clothes on. And we went over there behind that handy over there, way back behind there. There are some houses back there and some apartments I can't hardly remember. And they opened the door, and what we saw is a woman shaking like this vigorously, foaming at the mouth. And the kids were all, like, scared and say, Pastor, will you pray? We started calling on the name of Jesus. And Jesus delivered her. She began to cry. She began to say, all my life, I wanted my kids to go to church. I wanted my kids to find Jesus. She began to speak English. Why? Because there's power, not in the name of Matt Real, but there is power in that lovely name of Jesus. And I didn't say it in Hebrew. I said it in English. Praise the Lord. The devils know the name of Jesus. When I was in Korea, we were invited to go to a, an old theater. I might have told you the story. An old theater that had the big screen, walk-in theater, didn't have any seat because Koreans, they like sitting on the floor or that's what they had in the time. So we were invited to come and hold a three-day revival in this theater. We found out where the area was. It was in Weijangbu, Korea. We found out it was in a red district. No GI was supposed to be found nowhere near that red district because of prostitution and the things that were there the disease that came from being with those girls was something that they had no cure for. So they say, it's a red zone. Do not go into that area. You could be arrested if we catch you there. The bad thing about soldiers that disobey those orders and go there, then they bring that stuff to their families, bring it to their wives in the United States. So to, to, to try to help you out from doing such a horrendous thing and some of these diseases, once you get it, you cannot get rid of it. And so they, they forbid us to go in there. But the, the missionary, the, the interpreter that was there, he made plans. He started out handing out flyers. We're having a revival, a three-day revival in the theater. 
we got the flyer and Brother Mike Reardon was going to be the preacher. I was going to be the musician. We had two ladies that had accordions and they were going to play the accordion. They were going to sing and we were going to all have a revival. I was so new in the Lord. I, I wasn't used to being in, in the ministry, but I knew how to play the guitar. So I said, let's go. So we go. And we're walking into this area after we got out of the out of the taxi cab and we're walking and there's all these women that work there and they begin to spit on the girls that were with us. They don't like American women. There's too much competition, I guess. So they started spitting on the sisters that were with us. They just looked down and spit on them and stuff and we kept on going. We walked into that theater and they ushered us up to the platform. It was a real high platform about this big. And we got up there, and I was so scared, Brother Freddie. I was so scared. I just closed my eyes, and I just kept on playing the guitar with my eyes closed. And, and, and they, Brother Mike Reardon began to preach, and that interpreter would interpret. And then there was, an, when, when I finally opened my eyes, there was wall-to-wall -wall people everywhere. There was no place to sit on the floor. There was no place to stand. People looking in the windows, they came to the revival. Somebody told him that Jesus was going to be at the theater and that Jesus was a healer and they showed up. Now, our faith was not, my faith was not all that big. I thought, what in the world? What if Jesus don't show up and heal anybody? They're going to stone us. That's going through my mind. But praise the Lord for the Korean people that had faith. If we can go there and we can find Jesus, he will heal us. And people begin to get healed left and right. Brother Reardon would say, in Jesus' name. And, and, and the interpreter would say, Yesu Kanglisodo. You know what? Jesus could understand Jesus. And he could understand Yesu Kanglisodo. Why? Because he knows everything. He doesn't play games with it. No, unless you say it in Hebrew. Well, I don't know Hebrew. But I tell you what I do know. I know English, and I know how to say Jesus. And we saw, I didn't get to see it because I was so scared and had my eyes closed. But there was a lady over here to the left, came in with a growth. She had a tumor right here. It connected her chin to her chest. It was a big growth. And, and they, they, they testified of this. They said it really happened. I wish I would have kept my eyes open. I could have seen a, a real life miracle. My brother Reardon goes over there and he puts his hand on the lady and it says, in Jesus' name, this lady was Korean, but the God that we serve understands everything. And he understood Jesus for the power is in the name of Jesus. That tumor, boom, and it was gone. Gone. Those people shouted in that place and they jumped and they glorified God. So don't come telling me that I was baptized in uh, some kind of a foreign name. I know him to be Jesus. We had a pastor just passed away. Brother Lopez, Frank Lopez, just passed away last week, week before. I don't know if it was a COVID, but he was up in age. But when he was a real young man, he traveled all over the place in Peru. Very strong in the faith. And I'll never forget, we went to a place in Humphrey, Oklahoma. Little bitty church, just a little bigger than this. Packed full of people. And all of a sudden, there was a young girl that was possessed. And she began to slither like a snake up here in the front and foam and cuss and, and all kinds of stuff. It didn't scare Brother Frank. You know why? Because he knew the name that was above every name. Devil, you can act like a snake. You can foam at the mouth. My God is greater than all that you try to prove or show or scare us here. Brother Frank Lopez was not afraid. He went and in Spanish, this is a Spanish church. He put his hand on that girl. And el nombre de Jesucristo. And those demons come flying out of that girl. She was healed that night. She began to speak in another tongues. Somebody was sitting over here, and, and, and I cannot not attest for what they saw. They said they saw three little things come out of her walked out the back door and went out. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you that God knows his name. He knows it in Spanish. He knows it in Korean. He knows it in English. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, if I didn't have scripture, I wouldn't preach like this. 
But the Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 27, the Bible says, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? Am I in the Bible? This is Bible. It happened on the day of Pentecost. How many of you remember the Tower of Babel? The Tower of Babel, they were building a, a tower clear to the sky. They were going to build the tower that would go all the way to God. And God came and confused the languages. That's where all the language originated from. But on the day of Pentecost, God brought all those languages back to a heavenly language. When you speak in tongues, you're speaking a heavenly language. The devil would like to take credit for that. The devil would like for you to think, and a lot of people say, oh, when you speak in tongues, you, you are speaking in an evil language. No, the devil ain't that smart. The devil, all he can cause is confusion. But our God is bringing us together as we speak in that heavenly language. Saints of God, God is understanding. Our soul is understanding. Our ears and our mind cannot figure out what we're saying, but our soul is being directly attached to the living God. And so on the day of Pentecost, it's the first time people ever spoke in tongues. And the Holy Ghost came down, the Bible says, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And it appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And everybody began to gather around. Somebody said this morning that when we begin to unite in prayer, it's like the day of Pentecost. The Bible says they were all in one mind and in one accord. So when you and I begin to pray together, for the same purpose, I'm telling you what, we don't have to go out and invite people. We don't have to go out handing out tracts. We don't have to go knocking on doors. You know who is going to knock at their door? God is going to knock at their door. They're going to find their way here. It's happened many times. People walking past here, they feel, I, I feel like I need to go to that little church. We have baptized people after people after people. And where are these people, Pastor? Well, there's some in Lehigh. There are some in Fort Myers. There are some in Texas. There are some people that we don't know where they're at, but God knows where they're at. Why? Because they belong to him. They don't belong to Pastor Rios. I baptize you into the church. You know, God is not coming after Brother Rios. God is not coming after Brother Freddie. He's not coming after Brother Raymar. And I got news for you, Joseph. Joseph. Love this guy. I better not pick on him too much. But it's not about you, Joseph. God is not coming to get little Angelo, big Angelo. What are you saying, Pastor? Are we not any of us good enough? Well, no, we're not good enough. But you know what he's coming after? He's coming after a church. He's coming after one church. Not all the churches. He's coming after one church. He's coming after the church that has taken on his name. Somebody that is not afraid. Somebody that's not ashamed of the name. I'm not ashamed of the name of Jesus. For neither is there salvation in any other name. I don't know what I would have done if, if I asked my wife to marry me. She said, well, I'll marry you. But I'm taking that name Rios. Really? You want a white girl named Rios? She worked at a bank in Indiana. Everybody that came in there didn't speak English always went, oh, Miss Rios. I'm only Rios in name. I'm not Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. But she took on my name. And she wasn't ashamed. She's still not ashamed of the name Rios. I'm not ashamed of the name of Jesus. I'm not ashamed to take on his name. And the Bible says they begin to speak in tongues. Why? Because they were united in their prayers. They were in one place, in one accord. And they were all amazed, the Bible says, on the outside. Because they began to hear something going on inside. And they all came to look. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we? See, all the people that were in the upper room were Galileans. They were Jews that lived in Galilee. And Galilee had their own language. But the Jewish people also had their own language. So it's kind of like us Spanish people. We speak Spanish. We're in an English-speaking country, but we speak Spanish. Now, if some Korean people would work, were to walk in here and they could speak English, 
they would also speak English and Korean. And we wouldn't be able to communicate with them in their tongue, and they wouldn't be able to communicate with us. So this was what's going on on the day of Pentecost because the Jewish people came from all the surrounding countries. And it says on here, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. They're all Galileans, but we have come from other countries. We have come from Parthians, from Medes, from Elamites, from dwellers at Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, oh, hallelujah. We come from all these other countries, but praise the Lord, we can hear them speak in the town, in the city that we were from. So don't tell me that our God can't hear us when we say Jesus just because we're saying it in English or in nombre de Jesucristo when we say it in Spanish or Yasu when we say it in Korean. It's a saying that goes, necessity is the mother of invention. And to simplify what that means is when you have a need, you, you have a bolt or something that has fallen down the motor, and you can see the bolt, but you have no way of getting it. Your pliers are not long enough. Your, your fingers cannot reach it. And there's a necessity. you got to get that bolt out of there. You don't want that bolt getting inside of your motor and causing all kinds of problems. Not only that, but you need that bolt to put it back together. And so you begin to think, how am I going to get that bolt? You get a, a hanger. You put a, a hook on it. You can take a magnet and put on the end, a real strong magnet on the end of this hanger, and the magnetism goes all the way to the end. And you've invented something. Why? Because you had a need. So that's why they say that need, necessity, is the mother of invention. Every, everything that we have, people have invented. You don't want to invent something that is not needful. What are you going to do with it? You're not going to sell. We can look at that tripod in the back. It holds that camera beautifully. Somebody thought, I can stand here all day with a camera and, and I'll be all shaken. Or, hey, I got an idea. Why don't I take three sticks and put them down and put the camera on top of it? Why? Because they needed something. Now, the world has come to us, Christians, and say that we invented God because we want to know where we came from. We don't know where we came from. So in order to satisfy our curiosity, we have invented God and we say, well, okay, uh, let me see. Let me begin to write. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That sounds like an explanation. But I'm here to tell you, saints of God, when you begin to look at the word of God, there's not a human being alive. There is no computer that has been fabricated that could ever do what the word of God says. The word of God can go in your ears, down into your mind, and down into your heart and begin to change you. The person that feels so lost, that is always turning to this thing, turning to that thing, turning to this religion, turning to this name, turning to this day, when they begin to cry out to God, God will lead you to a church, God will lead you to a pastor, God will lead you to somebody at work that says Jesus is the answer for you today. And we begin to see how it works. Oh, I see what you're doing, God. Here are the same scientists, the same philosophers that says we invented God. They're forever inventing theories. They come to us with theories. Why do they call it a theory? Why don't they say this is the truth? This is where we come from. Because a theory can be changed. Once they find out that we're wrong, evolution, do you know that evolution has been found to be completely false? We all understand evolution, right? And we understand evolution is part true. Things do evolve. But to say that we come from evolution, that is so, so, such a lie. They have found out now that we've got the DNA to prove that there is no way our DNA could have ever skipped over from a 
uh, an amoeba and to be in a slug, to be in a shrimp, to be in a fish, to be in a crab, and to be in a frog. It just did not happen. Scientists know that that didn't happen. And you don't hear too many scientists now talking about evolution. Yes, we have things that evolved like our skin. If you're out working in the field, guess what? You're going to turn darker. This is something that our creator put in us. There's nothing smart enough. There is nothing intelligent enough to create anything that is even like us. So saints of God, when you find Jesus and when you find his word, you become complete. And I told you I would give you scripture. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, and I don't know if you have that or not, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 12, 8 through 12, and I'm fixing close in a minute. Colossians 2, chapter 8. This is Bible. This is not Brother Real. It's not UPC. The Bible says, beware. Everybody understands that word, beware, right? You see a sign on a, on a fence post, beware of dog. A lot of times there's not even a dog in there. but That's good enough for me, though, right? You know I'm scared of dogs. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. In other words, they're trying to answer supernatural by using natural. Everybody follow that? They're trying to use telescopes, microscopes, computers. Those are natural things to try to found, find the spiritual things of God, and they're never going to find them. And he says they're using the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him, the Bible says, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Anybody believe that? Say amen. amen. Now, if you don't believe that, I, 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 then, then I, I was telling Brother Angelo the other day and my daughter, my wife, we're all sitting there, Brother CJ, and we're talking about it's a sad thing when you hear people say, you know what? I just can't believe that. So sad. Because the Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not is already damned. So there's no hope. I have nothing to preach for somebody who says, you know, I just can't believe that. You have reached something in your, in your life, in your walk, that you're walking and, and looking and observing and trying to find out what's truth. And you stumble upon the word of God. Maybe it was a guy at work, or maybe it was a teacher at school, or maybe it was your friend uh, uh, that lives next to you. Somebody came to you with a gospel and explained to you the gospel. And you say, you know, I just can't believe that. I, I just can't. And, and it's a sad thing because it does not cost anything to believe. You can do it for free. That's why God made it that way. Because anybody can believe. Even a little child can believe. I got a little, I, he's not little now, but my, my youngest son, Austin, little five, I don't know how old he was, five years old. He was at church and he was at the altar. He found out that you, you had to have the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. He came up to the altar and he was praying. Little mama's in there. He's got his little hands up. I want the Holy Ghost. He, he, he had a, a hard time saying his R's. Jesus, I want the Holy Ghost. Little bitty guy. Didn't get the Holy Ghost. We went home that night. And they were saying their bedtime prayers. And he was in the bed. And my wife heard him. He was just a speaking in tongues. He wasn't speaking Spanish. He don't know how to speak Spanish. He wasn't speaking English. And my wife says, Austin, are you okay? I got the Holy Ghost, Mommy. I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Even a child can, can believe. Isn't that a smart God? What if God said you have to know algebra? What if God said you have to know trigonometry? God invented algebra. God invented trigonometry. All these things were already there. We discovered these things, but after we discovered algebra and trigonometry and all these things, 
we find out that the measurements of the sun, the measurements of the moon, the measurements of the, of the earth are so perfect that when, when the moon gets in front of the sun, the sun is umpteen million times bigger than the moon. But when that moon gets in front of the sun, it is a perfect cover, a perfect eclipse of the sun. Who did that? Who measured it? Now, we, you can call me silly, but if Jesus did do it, then who did it? Oh, I don't know, but I just can't believe that Jesus did well. I can believe because it don't cost me nothing. It's free. Free. Praise the Lord. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. And I want you to get that today. He is the principality. He is the head of all principality, of all power. There is nothing to be afraid of, saints of God, if you remain in Christ. Because the Bible says, and ye are complete, where? In him. Where is he at? In the Old Testament, he just, in the cosmos, and he would speak to men. And then in the New Testament, he comes in the form of a man. And the Bible says that he walked among us, and we beheld his glory. Where is he at now? I'm going to tell you where he is. Are you ready? He is in the church. We are the body of Christ. He is the head of the church. That's all in the Bible. You say in the church, you're in Christ. You get out of the church, you're no longer in Christ. No longer are you complete. I want to stay complete. I want to stay in the church, amen. Because the Bible says we are complete in him. And out of him, I am lost. He is the head of all principality. No wonder God said, if God before you, Oh, I got my neighbor. He he was knocking the window. So I'm going to pray for that neighbor. Because my God is over the neighbor. My God is over the police. My God is over the president of the United States. My God is God. He's the head of all principality and all powers. So if God be for you, who can be against you? I want to stay in him. How do I know, Pastor? How do I know if I'm in Christ or not? That is a real, real easy question to answer. Especially for all of us here. I think most of us, including Sister Shaw, you, you've worked in the garden, in the field. You, you know what crops are like. You know what happens when you break the vine off of a watermelon plant. It won't be like a day or two that vine begins to die. A lot of people like to play games. Well, I'm not going to church anymore, but I'm saved. Really. You better go back to the word of God. That you have to be in him. How am I going to be in him? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, he makes it really difficult, pastor. No, it makes it easy. That way you know if you're in or you're out. Unless you want to play games. Because when you leave the church, you will begin to see that you begin to die. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And that branch cannot survive without being attached to the vine. I got to be attached to Jesus Christ. He is in the church today. This is the form that he has chosen. I didn't choose the church. He chose the church. Amen. He, he said, unless God builds Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. I'm not building this church. This is God's work. This is God's building. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Let's stand. In whom also ye are the circumcised and the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. How am I going to do that, Pastor? 
by the circumcision of Christ. It says, how? Buried with him in baptism. The people of the Old Testament, they had to literally be circumcised. You and I are circumcised when we are buried with him. Our sins are washed away. I cannot baptize you in my name. That would give you no power. But there's something about that name. I can baptize you in the titles Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's no power there. But if I baptize you in the name of Jesus, amen. Buried with him. With who? With Christ. Look at the word right before there. Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Who had raised him from the dead. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We're not serving a God that is in the grave somewhere. We're not serving a God that is coming back as a little baby. We're not serving a God that is somehow buried in the grave or crucified on a cross. A lot of people like to carry a little crucifix. Oh, this is my God, right? Mediosito. But we're not serving Mediosito. We're serving a God that rose triumphantly. He said, I am he that liveth. Look at this miracle. He said, I am he that liveth. That word liveth means I live for everlasting to everlasting. I, I was alive before the world was formed. And I will always be alive. I am he that liveth and was dead. You can't do that, God. You're he that liveth. Oh, but our God can be at two places at one time. Our God can be livething, <laughs> living forever and ever. And come down to the dying thing like you and I. Once you are born into this world, guess what? There is no way out. There is no way out except for dying. He knew when he was born of a virgin. I got to die now. I got to die. Somebody said we taught him how to die. He taught us how to live. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that all we have to do is believe and obey. Oh, God, if we obey, if we truly believe, we will truly obey. And we will get in Christ, which is the head of all principalities and powers. Help us today as we go to our separate homes, as we dismiss from this place. Help us to be ready, oh God. Help us to be in Christ. And we are complete in you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Lord bless you.